Hey, good morning. Yes, it is. It's Friday, March 1st. So I thought today we'd take some time and, and talk about what is self-confidence, you know? And how do you get it? Are you born with it? You know, can you lose it and then gain it back? What is it? Is it elusive? Stay tuned. We'll find out together. So welcome back. My name is Eric, and this is Friday with weekday show. Today we're talking about self-confidence. You know, and we first have to define what is self-confidence, having confidence in yourself, I guess. And then try to figure out how, how do we get it and retain it? Well... Let's, let's break it down a little bit. Self-confidence is when you can do something and not sit there and fret about it. And don't... There's a big difference between self-confidence and being assertive and being aggressive. Two different things. A lot of times people get that mixed up somebody that's aggressive and knows what they want they're self-confident no they're not a lot of times they're just plowing through and they're trying to they don't have the self-confidence in it so they're usually running on a scripted program of this is what i need to do to get it done and when i get it done i'm going to fall over that's not self-confidence Growing up, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. I tended to be a people pleaser, so I am to a certain point. And confidence comes at an early age. <coughs> if you have like a steady home life, that's part of the key of having self-confidence. I didn't have a steady home life. You know, and being a military brat, we were up evil every two years and moving somewhere else, right? The only luck of it was up until the last move, we were still on base. And some of the kids that I was in school with we're also making the same move. Their parents were part of what my parent, my, my father was a, in, the, in the army and in the medical division. So a lot of times the guys that were with him or gals would all move to the next station together. And that brought us kids along. And so we had somebody we knew. But the, the last move that he made, he was a lieutenant colonel and he lived off base instead of on so we didn't hang out with the same kids and we didn't get to go to the same school that's on base it was close to base we went to one that was closest to <coughs> the housing that we lived in uh, in Lawton My father was a very aggressive alcoholic and came home from Vietnam, a different person than he went in. So he he wasn't a steady, someone that you could go to to get advice or somebody that would give you advice and give you good information and criticize when you weren't. It was a lot of criticizing of never being able to please him. My mom was just the opposite. You know, you couldn't do no wrong in her eyes. And yes, we got away with a lot of stuff with mom. 
the mom, you could go to her and she would be honest with you. She she would give you good sound advice and she was a steadfast adult in the room. But as time passed, I think I was, let's see, 13, 12, 11, 10, nine and a half or 10, my mom developed breast cancer. And they thought at first it was tuberculosis because both her and I tested positive for tuberculosis. And I was treated for a year for, for TB because my mom worked at one of the larger reservation hospitals in Lawton, close to Lawton, and they figured that's where she got it. So they started treating her for TB, you know. And then they checked all of us kids, and I was the only one that checked positive. I reacted to the, the TB test. So at that point, there went my steadfast adult in the room with her battling cancer. And back then, you know, they don't, they didn't have what we have now and the success rate, you know. A lot of times, if you develop breast cancer, it was death sentence, and it was for her. And she went fast downhill over that year. And my father still could not be the adult in the room. If anything, he drank more and got more aggressive. So the where I lucked out in my childhood was my father had shipped my grandparents on my mom's side had convinced my father send the four kids on a plane from Lawton, Oklahoma to Syracuse, New York. We'll pick up the kids and they'll stay with us for the time being because it was just going into summer. And what they were trying to get at with him was, you need to get your shit together and decide, are you gonna be a parent or aren't you gonna be a parent? And so when we got back to New York, my mom's parents, where I ended up staying and, and living, was taking on the four of us kids. And when my father finally moved, got the household in Lawton, and moved back to New York, which is up around Saranac, Plattsburgh area, that's where I was born, was up there. He wanted all of us kids back. My grandparents sat us down and said, it's up to you guys. You know, you're more than welcome to stay here if you don't want to go with your father, but you know, you need to make that choice. And my brother and I made the choice of staying put. And it was the best move I ever made, you know, for me anyways, because I finally got a steadfast adults in the room. My grandfather, was somebody could go to. And for a guy with a sixth grade education, the guy was, you know, very knowledgeable and always gave great advice. And he would criticize when you need to be criticized. But it was constructive criticism. It wasn't beating you down. It was, okay, this is what you did wrong. Do you see what you did wrong? And how do we correct it? I mean, how do we make it so it doesn't happen again? Or less often, you know? And my grandmother was a school teacher. So, I mean, she was... She loved baking and, and cooking for the two of us, my brother and I. 
And she was also very good to go to. And they both were well respected in the neighborhood and their community, very involved in their community, you know, and very involved in the church. But I can remember even up to hunting camp, my grandfather, they called him uh, the judge because he was always fair. He look at both sides and then he'd make his determination. And it was odd because when he would make his determination, he wasn't putting down either side. He was actually uplifting both sides, but explaining where one side had done something that they probably shouldn't have. And, and that's where the problem presented itself. So with having two steadfast parents in my life, my grandparents, still didn't give me a lot of self-confidence because, you know, I was screwed up. I'll be honest with you. And I was more of an introvert where I tended to hang out by myself and wicked people pleaser somebody wanted something done you know I go to the end of the earth to try to get it done to try to please them and being a people pleaser doesn't bring you confidence, doesn't bring you self-confidence. Because you're, you're focusing in the wrong area. You're focusing on trying to please that person instead of becoming more, what's the right word, um, But to do it more often and have less anxiety of doing it. Public speaking. You know, growing up, I was not a public speaker. Sp speaking into that. And I can remember in class, you know, even if I knew the answer, I wouldn't raise my hand. And I would sit there and just fear that the, the teacher would call my name. Even though I had the right answer. A lot of times, if they did call on me, I would be like a deer, you know, in the headlights of a vehicle, just, and I would freeze up. Because I was the opposite spectrum of being self-confident more than ever. Even when I met my wife, now, a lot of people would have said, Eric is full of self-confidence. You know, he knows what he wants, he goes after it, and, and it's like phenomenal. No, Eric isn't self-confident. Eric decided, I was in that transition of where I had gotten out of school and newly married and had a son growing into that point but I went from trying to please people because people kept letting me down but they didn't I was letting myself down see a lot of times it's more about you than it is somebody else and that's how we change but I went from trying to be a people pleaser to a person that if somebody posed a challenge, I would take the challenge on and I would, especially if someone said, you, you can't do that, watch, watch me. And that was my motivator. It wasn't because I was self-confident and I knew what I wanted out of life. It was, I'm going to prove you wrong no matter what. See, when I first met my wife, my first wife, her parents had a dairy farm. And that was really the first 
hands-on that I ever had when it came to being on a farm. You know, I wasn't grown on a farm. I was a military brat. So being around cows and pigs and they had a pair of geese that would chase you down the driveway and bite you in the ass if you, I mean, them little bastards like to shot them. But I hadn't had any experience in that field. So with trying to help my future wife, I would help out around the farm. Whether it be, you know, baling hay or stacking hay to milking cows to feeding the pigs whatever needed to be done I was doing it because by doing it I was trying to please my future in-laws and make it easier on my future wife because she was doing a lot of it But what I can tell you is with a not a lot of experience, I finally, I went to work. I had to go to work. I had to get income coming in, right? So I went to work for this gal and she taught me a lot about farming in the year and a half that I was there. And I got $200 a month, 150 went for rent, so 50 a month had to cover fuel, heating, food, wasn't a lot of money, folks. But I was told, you'll never last working for her. And I said, why is that? I said, well, she's hard on people, can't keep anybody. The hours and the pay. She wants you to do everything for nothing. So I talked with my father-in-law. I said, what do you think? He said, you know, Eric, you got to start somewhere. You know, sometimes experience is worth more than money. It's your call. But he said, I'll support you either way, you know. But I think you should go for it. So I did. And as I was telling you, when I first met my wife, I weighed 240, 250 pounds, maybe 60 pounds, I can't remember. And I had to, when I went to work for her, Marion, the hours were from 5 in the morning to whenever we got done at night, which was 8, 8.30, sometimes 9 o'clock, you know. And I couldn't afford put fuel in my vehicle to get back and forth to work. But the walk was like three and a half, four miles. So I would walk to work in the morning. I'd get up an hour earlier and start hoofing it. And then a lot of times her son, Junior, would give me a ride back at night after, after night chores. But I wouldn't quit because I was trying to prove to everybody else that they're wrong and that I'm right. I can do it. And that's where I had my strength. Again, it wasn't self-confidence. It was trying to prove somebody wrong. And that, I tell you, isn't always the best way to go about life, is trying to prove people wrong. You can accomplish a lot of things. But is it worth it? What did you get from it? In her case, you know, I went from a very chunky down to 162 pounds. And I wouldn't eat until I got home at night after night chores. So that's where I started. I only eat once a day. And that's where I started eating just once a day when I got home at 8 or 8.30. And to this day, I only have one meal a day, and it's around 6 o'clock at night. Other than that, it's coffee or water. That's it. But she taught me. She was steadfast. She was confident, knowledgeable, 
and would give you constructive criticism if you were willing to listen. That was the key. She could tell if you were really serious and interested in what you guys were talking about. She'd been around the block a few times. And in me, she found somebody that had the willingness to learn and the willingness to learn from my mistakes. And that when she gave me constructive criticism, I took it to heart and, and tried to make the changes. Sometimes slowly, quicker times than other times, you know. But, but within that year and a half time of being a non-farmer military brat, growing up in a small country town with my grandparents, never been around a farm. In that year and a half, she gave me enough knowledge, enough wisdom, enough kahunas that I stepped out and took on the role of managing farms. Instead of being the low man on a totem pole, I took on with confidence because she has shown me how to gain self-confidence and that's doing things and and getting better at it getting better at it until you you do you do well and you're confident but i still had the aggressive side of trying to prove people wrong but the confidence that i knew what i was doing if that makes any sense and i went from you know, my future in-law's farm of them milking 12, 15 cows to working for Marion that was milking 60 to managing dairies that were milking 80 to 100 cows. And a lot of times they would hire both my wife and I as a, a group, a couple, you know, to give us a place to stay, a house, trailer and would pay us based on two people being there to for milking and feeding the animals and all that because one person couldn't do it all so a lot of times she would come up and at least help me get started and then go back home with the kids all this time I'm building self-confidence and now I know I can do it and I can do it well but I always kept my options open of how can I do it better. So the gradual, the next step, after running a few farms for the next couple of years, was actually buying my own farm. And most people at 21, 22, did not own a dairy farm that had almost 300 acres of ground I had 70 head milking in the cow, in the barn. It would only hold 60. So I milked the first 60, kick out, and then bring in another 10. You know, and hang, we would get hanged on. We were putting up 14,000 bales, 12 to 14,000 bales a year, and we'd knock it out. But as that grew and kept getting like that, I went more from trying to prove to people what I could do, because I guess I had already had, to trying to become more self-confident in what I was doing and trying to find that place of where you're zen, you know, where you feel you fit in. Because I never felt I fit in anywhere. I always felt like I was the odd guy out no matter what. And at that time, I didn't have a lot of friends. But I hardly ever left the farm until I started working the second job and the third job to support the farm. I'm going to start wrapping this up. It's almost 24 minutes, 25 minutes. And I'll do a part two to this of how I gain in self-confidence over being insecure to trying to prove to people that I could do what they say couldn't be done 
to gaining self-confidence. It's all stepping stones, folks. You don't get self-confidence like the snap of your finger. I mean, for some it's easier, and a lot of times it's how you were raised, your home life, and so forth. But you're never too old to become self-confident. So stay tuned for part two. I'll probably do that either tomorrow or Sunday. All right, you guys have a great Friday and a great weekend. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks so much for watching.